Hello everyone, welcome. This is a repeat of a video that I did about um, three, four days ago on the Hebrews, the um, ancient Hebrews and Palestine. Uh, I, had to, I, I have to redo it for a number of reasons. Um, I won't go into that, it's a little bit uh, complicated, but I'm going to read from the book that I, I had introduced to you. This is a repeat, by the way, which is uh, this book, um, The Ancient, Ancient Times, The History of the Early World. And it is by Professor Prestet, um, first um, written in 1910, and uh, the second edition was in 1936. And the reason I chose this one is because it's a very easy read, it's very well explained, it's summarized, it's concise, and it was actually a, um, a, uh, a, a textbook. At the end of each chapter, <coughs> he asks questions and there are directions for the teachers on what to emphasize and so on. And it's, uh, I, I, I just thought it was the best one that I could find. And because we have <coughs> at the moment the current situation of wars and so on and whose land is it and, and all kinds of questions. Um, I thought that uh, it's not a very, I'm going to read it, okay, because I, ju I just don't want to put it in my own words in case I forget or misrepresent something. Um, so bear with me, it's not a long chapter, I think it will be about half an hour or so. I'll start. Uh, Western Asia, the Hebrews, Palestine and the predecessors of the Hebrews there. Situation and extent of Palestine, the home of the Hebrews. The home of the Hebrews was on the western end of the Fertile Crescent, in a land now called Palestine. It is the region lying along the southeastern corner of the Mediterranean, a narrow strip between desert and sea. For while the sea limits it on the west, the wastes of the desert bay sweep northward, forming the eastern boundary of Palestine. It was about 150 miles long, and less than 10,000 square miles are included within these limits. That is, Palestine was somewhat larger than the state of Vermont in the United States. Much of this area is unproductive, or was unproductive, for the desert intrudes upon southern Palestine and rolls northward in gaunt and arid limestone hills, even surrounding Jerusalem. Let's look at the geographical character of Palestine first. The valleys of northern Palestine, however, are rich and productive. The entire land is without summer rains and is dependent upon the winter rainy season for moisture. There is no opportunity for irrigation and the harvest is therefore scantier than in lands enjoying summer rains. Only the northern end of the Palestinian coast has any harvest. But these were already, had already been seized by the Phoenicians. Palestine thus remained cut off from the sea. In natural resources, <clears throat> it was too poor ever to develop prosperity or political power like its great civilized neighbors on the Nile and Euphrates or in Syria and Phoenicia. Here at the western end of the Fertile Crescent, as at the eastern end, the Semitic nomads, nomads from the desert bay mingled with the dwellers in the northern mountains of the highland zone. The northerners 
chiefly early Anatolians and then called Hittites, from Asia Minor and Syria, left their mark on the Semites of Palestine. The prominent aquiline nose, still considered to be the mark of the Semite, especially of the Jew, was really a feature belonging to the non-Semitic Anatolians, who intermarried with the people of Palestine and gave them uh, this uh, an, an Anatolian uh, type of face. Strange faces from many a foreign clime crowded the marketplaces of Palestine amid a babel of various languages. Here, the rich jewelry, bronze dishes and ivory furniture of the Nile craftsmen mingled with the pottery of the Aegean islands and of the highland civilization and with the gay woolens of Babylon. The donkeys, which lifted their complaining voices above the hubbub of the market, had grazed along the shores of both Nile and Euphrates, and their masters had trafficked beneath the Babylonian tower temples, as well as under the shadow of the Theban obelisks. We recall how traffic with Babylonia had taught these western Semites to write in the cuneiform hand. To the caravan coming, uh, caravan coming out of Egypt, Palestine was the entrance to the bridge between Africa and Asia, a middle ground where the civilizations of Egypt and Babylonia, Phoenicia and the Aegean, and the highland zone, all represented by their wares, met and commingled as they did nowhere else in the ancient Near East. Just as the merchandise of the surrounding nations met in peaceful co competition in the markets of Palestine, so the armies of these nations also met there in battle. The situation of Palestine between its powerful neighbors on the Nile and on the Euphrates made it the battleground where these great nations fought for many centuries. Over and over again, unhappy Palestine went through the experience of little Belgium in the conflict between Germany and France in 1914. For many centuries, Egypt held Palestine as a subject country. We recall how Assyria later conquered it and Chaldea enslaved it, and we shall yet find it in the power of Persia. When, therefore, the Hebrews originally took possession of the land, there was little prospect that they would ever long enjoy freedom from foreign oppression. The settlement of the <clears throat> settlement of the Hebrews in Palestine and the United Hebrew Kingdom. The Hebrew invasion into Palestine is about from 1400 to 1200 BC. The Hebrews were all originally men of the Arabian desert, wandering with their flocks and herds and slowly drifting over into the final home in Palestine. For two centuries, about 1400 to 1200 BC, their movement from the desert into Palestine continued. Another group of their tribes had been slaved in Egypt where they had suffered much hardship under a cruel pharaoh. They were successfully led out of Egypt by the heroic leader Moses, a great national hero whose achievements his people never forgot. On entering Palestine, the Hebrews found the Canaanites there, already dwelling there in flourishing towns protected by massive walls. The Hebrews were able to capture only the weaker Canaanite towns. As the rough Hebrew shepherds looked across the highlands of northern Palestine, 
they beheld their kindred scattered over far stretching hilltops with the frowning walls of many a Canaanite stronghold rising between them. Even Jerusalem in the Judean highlands for centuries defied the assaults of the Hebrew invaders, who had no siege machinery for attacking city walls. Let us remember that by that time these unconquered Palestinian towns possessed the civilization 1500 years old already, with comfortable houses, government, industries, trade, writing and religion. The Hebrews adopt Canaanite civilization, a civilization which the Hebrew shepherds were soon adopting, for they could not avoid intercourse with, this, uh, with the unsubdued Canaanite towns as trade and business threw them together. And this mingling with the Canaanites produced the most profound changes in the life of the Hebrews. Most of them left their tents and began to build houses like those of the Canaanites. They put off the rough sheepskin they had uh, worn in the desert, and they put on fine Canaanite raiment and gaily colored woolen wool, uh, woven wool. And after a time, in appearance, occupation, and manner of life, the Hebrews were not to be distinguished from the Canaanites among whom they lived. In short, they had adopted Canaanite civilization. Just as newly arrived immigrants among us soon adopt our clothing and our ways. These changes did not proceed everywhere at the same rate. In the less fertile south, the Hebrews were more attached to the old desert life so that many would not give up the tent and the old freedom of the desert. The wandering life of the nomad shepherd on the Judean hills could still be seen from the walls of Jerusalem. Here then were two different modes of life among the Hebrews. In the fertile north of Palestine, we find the settled life of the town and its outlying fields, and in the south, on the other hand, the wandering life of the nomad still went on. For centuries, this difference formed an important cause of discord among the Hebrews. Fortunately for the Hebrews, Egypt was in a state of decline by 1100 BC and Assyria in the east had not yet conquered the west. The foundations of the Hebrew nation, Saul the first king. But a Mediterranean people called Philistines or Philistines had at this time migrated from the island of Crete to the sea plain at the southwest corner of Palestine. These Philistines formed a highly civilized and warlike nation, or group of city kingdoms. Hard pressed by the Philistines, the Hebrews' local leaders, or judges, as they were called, found it no easy task to unite their people into one nation. About a generation before the year 1000 BC, however, a popular leader named Saul succeeded in gaining for himself the office of king. And the new king, this new king, was a southerner who still loved the old nomadic customs. He was not fond of a fixed abode and preferred to dwell in a tent. In a fierce struggle to thrust back the Philistines, Saul was disastrously defeated, and seeing the rout of the army, he fell upon his own sword and died. 
in a few years, the ability of David, one of Saul's daring men at arms, whom he had just out, uh, unjustly outlawed, won the support of the south. So David, King David, is going to be from about 1000 to 960 BC. Seeing the importance of possessing a strong castle, the sagacious David selected the ancient fortress on the steep hill of Jerusalem, hitherto held by the Canaanites. The oldest occurrence of the name of the place has recently been found in Egyptian writing, writings over a thousand years older than David's time. He took possession of the venerable city and made it his residence. Here he ruled for a time as king of the south. They were divided, yes till his valor as a soldier and his victories on all sides won him also the support of the more prosperous north. And the Philistines were now beaten off and David ruled over an extensive Hebrew kingdom. He enjoyed a long and prosperous reign and his people never forgot his heroic deeds as a warrior or his skill as a poet and singer. Solomon and the division of his kingdom. This is about 930 BC. David's son, Solomon, became like the Hammurabi in Egypt. Uh, one of the kings, uh, go to, I have another video on, on Egypt, you may see it. Uh, one of the, uh, he, Solomon became one of the leading merchants of the East. He trafficked, trafficked in horses and launched a trading fleet in partnership with Hiram, the Phoenician king of Tyre. His wealth enabled him to marry a daughter of the king of Egypt, and he delighted in oriental luxury and display. He removed the portable tent which the Hebrews had thus far used as a temple. And with the aid of his friend, King Hiram, who lent him a skilled Phoenician workman, he built a rich temple of stone in Jerusalem. Such splendor demanded a great income, and so to secure it, he weighed down the Hebrews with heavy taxes. The resulting discontent of his subjects was so great that under Solomon's son, the northern tribes withdrew from the nation and set up a king of their own. Thus, the Hebrew nation was divided into two kingdoms, before it was a century old. The two Hebrew kingdoms, again, and the contrast between these two Hebrew kingdoms. There was much hard feeling between the two Hebrew kingdoms and sometimes fighting. Israel, as we call the, nor the northern kingdom, was rich and prosperous. Its marketplaces were filled with industry and commerce since the Canaanites. Yeah? Its fertile fields produced plentiful crops. Israel displayed the wealth and success of town life. On the other hand, Judah or Judea, yeah. the southern kingdom was poor. Its land was meager. Besides Jerusalem, it had no large towns. Many of the people still wandered with their flocks. These two methods of life came into conflict in many ways, but especially in religion. Every old Kanai town for centuries had had its local town god called Baal or Lord. The Hebrew townsmen therefore found it very natural to worship the gods of their neighbors, the Kanai townsmen. They were thus unfaithful to their old Hebrew god, Yahweh. 
To some devout Hebrews, therefore, and especially to those in the south, the Canaanite gods seemed to be the protectors of the wealthy class in the towns, with their luxury and injustice to the poor, while Yahweh appeared as the guardian of the simpler shepherd life of the desert, and therefore the protector of the poor and the needy. There was growing reason for such beliefs less than a century after the separation of the two kingdoms. Ahab, a king of the north, had had Naboth, one of his subjects, killed in order to seize a vineyard belonging to Naboth and thus to enlarge his palace gardens. Reports of such wrongs stir the anger of Elijah, a Hebrew of the old nomad habits, who lived in the desert east of the Jordan. Still wearing his desert sheepskin, he suddenly appeared before Ahab in the ill-gotten vineyard and denounced the king for his seizure of it, or his theft. Thus, this uncouth figure from the desert proclaimed war between Yahweh and the injustice of town life. Elijah's followers seems to be a political leader. Elijah's followers finally killed not only the entire northern royal family but also the priests of the Canaanite gods or Baals. Such violent methods, however, could not accomplish lasting good. They were the methods of Hebrews who thought of Yahweh only as a war god. Besides such violent leaders as these, there were also among the Hebrews more peaceable men who likewise chafed under the injustice of town life. This turned fondly back to the grand old days of their shepherd wanderings, out on the broad reaches of the desert, where no man ground the faces on the, of the poor. This point of view is picturesquely set forth in a simple narrative history of the Hebrew forefathers, a glorified picture of their shepherd life as we find it in the immortal tales of the Hebrew patriarchs of Abraham and Isaac, of Jacob and Joseph. These tales among, belong among the noble, noblest literature which has survived to us from the past. We should notice also that they are the earliest example of historical writing in prose, of finished literary style which we have inherited it is now quite clear that such men were acquainted now with the papyrus rolls written by Egyptian social reformers over a thousand years earlier in defense of the poor and the helpless. We now know that such Egyptian documents were sometimes translated into Hebrew, for an Egyptian roll has been found containing a collection of wise proverbs, a section of which was included in the Book of Proverbs, proverbs and later circulated under the name of Solomon. As they read such writings of the old Egypt Egyptian champions of the poor, the Hebrew prophets and reformers took courage and gained new ideas. Another century passed, and about 750 BC, another figure in sheepskin appeared in the streets of Bethel, where the northern kingdom had an important temple. It was Amos, a shepherd from the hills of Judah in the south. Amos uh, taught peaceful methods of uh, he was a reformer and a prophet it was amos a shepherd from the hills of judah in the south in the solitudes of his shepherd life amos had learned to see in yahweh far more than a war god of the desert to him yahweh seemed to be a god of 
fatherly kindness, not demanding bloody butchery like that practiced by Elijah's followers, but nevertheless a God who rebuked the selfish and oppressive wealthy class of the towns. The simple shepherd could not resist the inner impulse to journey to the northern kingdom and proclaim to the luxurious townsmen there the evils of their manner of life. We can imagine the surprise of the prosperous northern Hebrews as they suddenly met this rude shepherd figure clad in sheepskin, standing at street corners, addressing a crowd of townsmen. He was denouncing their showy clothes, the fine houses, the beautiful furniture, and above all, their corrupt lives and hard-heartedness towards the poor among their fellow Hebrews, whose lands they seize for their debt and whose labor they gain by enslaving them. These things had been unknown in the desert, but by such addresses as these, Amos, of course, endangered his life, but he thus became the first social reformer in Asia. We apply the term prophet to the great Hebrew leaders who pointed out the way toward unselfish living, brotherly kindness, and a higher type of religion. Thus, began in Western Asia the same kind of effort to lead men to show justice and kindness towards all, especially toward the poor, which had long been known in Egypt, and it is probable that Amos had heard of such Egyptian teachings. Fearing that his teachings might be lost if they remained merely spoken words, Amos finally sat down and put his sermons into writing, and thus they have survived to us. The Hebrews learned to write. While all this had been going on, the Hebrews had been learning to write, as so many of their nomad predecessors on the fertile crescent, crescent had done before them. They were now abandoning the clay tablet and wrote on papyrus with the Egyptian pen and ink. They borrowed their alphabet from the Phoenician and the Aramean merchants. It is certain that our earliest Hebrew historian's admiration for the nomad life did not prevent him, however, Amos, from making use of this new and great convenience of town life that is writing. The rolls containing the beautiful tales of the patriarchs, of bearing the teachings of such men as Amos, were the first books which the Hebrews produced, their first literature. Such rolls of papyrus were exactly like those which had been in use in Egypt for over 2,000 years already. The discovery of the household papers of a Hebrew community in Egypt has shown us just how such a page of Hebrew or Aramaic writing looked like. But literature remained the only art that the Hebrews possessed. They had no painting, sculpture or architecture, and if they needed these things, they borrowed from their great neighbors, Egypt, Phoenicia, Damascus, and Assyria. The destruction of the Hebrew kingdom by Assyria and Chaldea from the east. First, the destruction of the northern kingdom by Assyria. This is in 722 BC. While the Hebrews had been deeply stirred by their own conflicts at home, <clears throat> such men as Amos had also perceived and proclaimed the dangers coming from abroad, and he speaks of them, from beyond the borders of Palestine, especially Assyria. Amos indeed announced the coming destruction of the northern kingdom by Assyria because of the evil lives of the people. As Amos had foreseen, Assyria first swept away 
first Damascus, then the, uh, and then the kingdom of Israel was therefore left exposed. And so it was the next victim. And Samaria, its capital, was captured by the Assyrians in the year 722 BC. Of the unhappy northern Hebrews, 27,290 well-to-do people were carried away as captives. And the northern nation, called Israel, was destroyed after having existed for a little over two centuries. The national hopes of the Hebrews were now centered in the helpless little kingdom of Judah to the south, which struggled on for another for over a, a century and a quarter more, in the midst of a great world conflict in which Assyria was the unchallenged champion. Thus, far thoughtful Hebrews had been accustomed to think of their God as ruling in, I'll read that again. Thus far, thoughtful Hebrews had been accustomed to think of their God as ruling in Palestine only. But now they were learning that Palestine was part of a great political world. Did he, Yahweh, did he have the power also over the past world arena where all the mighty nations were fighting? But if so, was not Assur, the great god of victorious Assyria, stronger than Yahweh, the god of the Hebrews? And many a despairing Hebrew, as he looked out over the hills of Palestine, wasted by the armies of Assyria, felt in his heart that Assur, the god of the victorious Assyrians, who ruled nearly all Western Asia, must indeed be stronger than Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. It was in the midst of these somber doubts, like that in the years, bef in the years before 700 BC, that the princely prophet Isaiah in one great oration after another addressed the multitudes which filled the streets of Jerusalem, the host of the hosts of Sennacherib were at the gates. That's the king. Um, and the terrified throngs in the city were expecting at any moment to hear the thunder of the great Assyrian war engines battering down the crumbling walls of their city. As they had crushed the walls of Damascus and Samaria before. Then the bold words of the dauntless Isaiah lifted them from despair like the triumphant call of a trumpet. He told them that Yahweh ruled a kingdom far larger than Palestine, that he controlled the great world arena, where he, and not Assur, was the triumphant champion. If the Assyrians had wasted and plundered Palestine, it was because they were but the lash, the lash in the hands of Yahweh, who was using them as a scourge in his own hands to punish Judah for its wrongdoings. Thus, while the people were momentarily expecting the destruction of Jerusalem, Isaiah undauntedly proclaimed a great and glorious future for the Hebrews and speedy disaster for the Assyrians. When at length, a pestilence from the marshes of the eastern Nile Delta swept away the army of Sennacherib and saved Jerusalem. It seemed to the Hebrews the destroying angel of Yahweh who had smitten the Assyrian host. Some of the Hebrews then began to see that Yahweh ruled a larger world than Palestine. Their own ideas were stimulated by the great Sanhim of Ignaton, 
the Egyptian king, which had long been circulating in Western Asia as one of the Hebrew psalm shows. This king, Ignaton, an Egyptian king, he was actually if you if you listen to the video on Egypt he actually also thought perhaps the first one to think of a universal god a kind god and destroyed all the other gods of the egyptian well they had the the, the sun and the nile and then together isiris and so on but destroyed all those temples and proclaimed the one omnipotent god universal god but it wasn't to last. After he died, they went back to, to the old gods. So compare these two passages from the hymns of one of the hymns of Ignaton, the Egyptian king, from, from Ignaton's sung hymn, How manifold are thy works! They are hidden before men, O soul God, beside whom there is no other. Thou didst create the earth according to thy will. And then in the Psalms, the Psalm 104, we read, O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. Anyway, they were probably influenced uh, by the uh, uh, sun hymn. Now, the destruction of the southern kingdom by Chaldea. And this is in 586 BC. Nearly a century after the deliverance from, uh, from Sennacherib, the king of the Assyrians, they beheld and rejoiced over the destruction of Nineveh in 612, and they fondly hoped that the fall of Assyria meant final deliverance from foreign oppression. But they had only, they had only exchanged one, really one foreign lord for another, and Chaldea followed Assyria in control of Palestine. Then. The unsubmissive Hebrews of Judah met the same fate which their kindred of Israel in the north had suffered. And in 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, the Chaldean king, destroyed Jerusalem and carried away the people to exile in Babylonia. Or Babylon. The Hebrew nation, both north and south, was thus wiped out after having existed about four and a half centuries. So now they were sent captive to Babylon. The Hebrews in exile and their deliverance by the Persians. Jeremiah and a temple of the Hebrews in Egypt. Some of the fugitives fled to Egypt. Among them was the melancholy prophet Jeremiah, who had foreseen the coming destruction of Jerusalem with its temple of Yahweh. He strove to teach his people that each must regard his own heart as a temple of Yahweh, which would endure long after his temple in Jerusalem had crushed into ruin. Recent excavation has restored to us the actual papers of a colony of Hebrews in Egypt uh, at Elephantine. These papers show that the exiled Hebrews in Egypt had not yet reached Jeremiah's ideal of a temple of Yahweh in every human heart. For they had built a temple of their own in which they carried on the worship of Yahweh. Similarly, the Hebrew exiles in Babylonia were not yet convinced of the truth of the teaching they had heard from their great leaders and prophets. They were at first only grief and uh, unanswered questionings, 
of which the echo still reaches by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down, yea, we wept when we remember Zion, Jerusalem. Upon the willows in the midst thereof, we hung up our harps. How shall we sing Yahweh's song in a strange land? This is from the Psalms, Psalm uh, 137, 1, 4. Had they not left Yahweh behind in Palestine? And then arose a wonderful teacher among the Hebrew exiles, and out of centuries of affliction gave them the answer. In a series of tri triumphant speeches, this greatest of the earlier Hebrews declared Yahweh to be the creator and sole God of the universe. He explained to his fellow exiles that suffering and affliction were the best possible training and discipline to prepare a people for service. He announced, therefore, that by afflicting them, Yahweh was only preparing his suffering people for service to the world and that he would yet restore them and enable them to fulfill a great mission to all men. He greeted the sudden rise of Cyrus, the Persian king, with joy. All kings, he taught, were but instruments in the hands of Yahweh, who through the Persians would overthrow the Chaldeans and return the Hebrews to their land. Thus had the Hebrew vision of Yahweh slowly grown. From the days of their nomad life, when they had seen him only as a fierce tribal war god, having no power beyond the corner of the desert where they lived, until now, when they had come to see that he was a kindly father and a righteous ruler of all the earth. This was monotheism, a belief which made Yahweh the sole god. They had reached it only through a long development, which brought them suffering and disaster, a discipline lasting many centuries. Just as the individual today, especially a young person, learns from his mistakes and develops character as he suffers for his own errors, so the suffering Hebrews had outgrown many imperfect ideas. They thus illustrated the words of the greatest of the Hebrew teachers, says this author, meaning Jesus, quote, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. That is the parable of the sower. If you sow in fertile ground, all that. By this rich and wonderful experience of the Hebrews in religious progress, the whole world was yet to profit. When the victorious Persian king Cyrus entered Babylon, the Hebrew exiles there greeted him as their deliverer. His triumph gave the Hebrews a Persian ruler. Persia, Iran. With great humanity, the Persian kings, however, allow the exiles to return to their native land. With great humanity, the Persian kings allowed the exiles to return to their native land. Some had prospered in Babylon and did not care to return, but at different times, enough of them went back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city on a very modest scale and to restore the temple. The authority given by the Persian government to the returned Hebrew leaders enabled them to establish and publish the religious laws which have ever since been revered by the Jews. The religion thus organized by the returned Hebrew leaders 
we now call Judaism, the religion of the Jews. Under it, the old Hebrew kinship was not, the monarchy was not revived. In its place, a high priest at Jerusalem became the ruler of the Jews. The Jewish state was thus a religious organization, a church with a priest at its head. The leaders of this church devoted themselves to the study of the ancient writings of their race still surviving in their hands. A number of the old writings, some of them uh, mentioned in the Old Testament, have been lost. They arranged and copied the orations and sermons of the prophets and all the old Hebrew writings they possessed. As time went on and the service of the restored temple developed, they arranged the remarkable book of 150 religious songs, the hymn book of the second temple, known to us as the book of Psalms. For a long time, indeed for centuries, these various Hebrew books, such as the Law, the Prophets and the Psalms, circulated in separate roles, and it did not occur to anyone to put them together to form one book. And this was not done until Christian times that the Jewish leaders put all these old writings of their fathers together to form one book. Printed in Hebrew as they were orig originally written, they form the Bible of the Jews at the present day. These Hebrew writings have also become a sacred book of the Christian nations. In, it, is, it, it, it is called the Old Testament and is today the most precious legacy which we have inherited from the ancient Near East before the coming of Christ. It tells the story of how a rude shepherd folk issued from the wilds of the Arabian desert to live in Palestine where they were prepared to understand religious writings of the earlier great nations of the East, especially Egypt, and thus to pass through experiences which made them the religious teachers of the civilized world. And we should further remember that crowning all their history, there came forth from them in due time the founder of the Christian religion. One of the most important things that we owe to the Persians, therefore, was their restoration of the Hebrews to Palestine. The Persians thus saved and aided in transmitted to us, transmitting to us the great legacy from Hebrew life, which we have in the Old Testament and in the life of the founder of Christianity. Thank you. I find it fascinating, actually. So many things here that I did not know. Um, thank you for listening. Bye-bye.